you know, I think I'm going to irritate you all today. Not with what I say, but what I'm about ready to ask you to do. But I'd like to see it just one time. Could everybody get up and come sit in this one center section, please? <laughs> you can start. Was that Jeff saying that? Yeah. You can start the recording, and then you can come sit down. What are you doing that to me for? On the computer. Ah, much better. I like it. That's right. And I don't see that good far off. No. If we're going to be a family, we should sit like a family. <laughs> <laughs> Brian's giving me googly eyes. <laughs> uh, we should sit like a family. We should be together. And it probably does help, because I do like this better, when you're, the person's talking up here. If everybody's right in here, you don't have to do this, and then that, and then back there, and over there. And I like it. Y'all consider it. Uh, as Freddie said, it's the last day on Leavened. Um, but... We know this is not the end of the feast because this feast begins another feast. We always talk about this. And um, <clears throat> this is also, you know, the first week has gone by heading towards the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Pentecost. And so we have 50 days, or not quite 50 days now, um, of reflection and furthering our, you know, we, we talk about this week we've taken this leavening out of our houses and, and our life and you know it's hard for me this week because I'm out traveling delivering the wine and um, it's hard to grab something to eat uh, like I'm usually used to just grabbing a, a quick sandwich or something or uh, just some chicken tenders it's hard so um, you, you know you deal with it as best you can but the whole idea is, you know, we're, we're getting that sin out of our life. We're, we're getting, um, we're trying to make ourselves sin free. And we don't do the best job because we're weak. We stumble. We get forgetful and stuff like that. We're not as strong as Jesus Christ was. And that's acceptable. Um, not so much to us as it is to him. He understands. And um, so what we need to do is not, I mean, it, it's the last day of unleavened, so we can go on and eat the breads and stuff tomorrow or tonight even and, and move on. But don't forget the effort made to unleaven yourself, to sin free yourself this week and let it launch you towards Pentecost, which is another great day in God's plan in that this is when the Holy Spirit came. The greatest gift that we are given as mortals is the Holy Spirit. And I probably beat that horse, that dead horse, too much myself. But I, I just um, am, I, I just, I love the Spirit. It, it amazes me. And um, so let that be on your mind as we travel towards Pentecost. This feast is not over. Keep the sin out of your life. Keep moving with your mind and your thoughts anchored in Christ. Because this is what it's all about. You know, I'm going to be saying this probably all through the future now. We chose to be great. Be great. Now, that's kind of like a little side note there. Freddie said I got lots of time. That's a dangerous thing with me. <laughs> Uh, okay. when he said that Ramona and Cain both turned and looked at me and were like oh no um, so now I'm going to get into my message for today and this is going to be um, you really won't have 
a lot of time, I mean, I'm not going to rush through this, but you probably won't have time to go back and forth to each scripture that I call because I'm going to be all over the Bible, Old and New Testament. And I'm putting, I'm putting all these different scriptures together to tell the story of the week, to tell the story of why we're here on a Friday, why we were taking all the leavening and throwing it out of our house and not giving it away or not you know, hiding it in the garage or at work and then bringing it back in later. We just we threw it all out. We got rid of it. Um, and it's an awesome story because our God is an awesome God, as Mr. Mullins said and sang. So we're going to start in John, the first book, um, in the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Everything was made by this Word. It says right there, nothing was made by this word, or without this word making it. I'm sorry, I kind of said that wrong. But uh, he created everything. And then we go to John 1, 14, and it says here, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This word became a man. This is Jesus Christ. Everybody knows what I'm talking about here. We've been over this a lot. Jesus Christ became flesh. He was a human being full of grace and truth. In John 21, verse 25, it says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Here John is telling us that Jesus did so much. And we know the miracles, the healings that are recorded. Turning water to wine. You know I'd have to bring that one up. Uh, the healings. The man with the withered hand. The blind man. The things he did. And John says that if everything was written down, the world couldn't contain the books. It's so much. Jesus was incredible. Jesus was God. In John 1, 34, it says, And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God, Christ. You know, the Jews looked for Christ to come. They looked for the Messiah. Messiah ben David. They wanted him to come. But they were too blind to see him when he came because they could not compare his life to Scripture. Although, albeit today, we can compare that. We see it. But they couldn't see it. So they came, or he came, and they didn't understand him. They didn't like him. They were afraid of him. Jesus had too many followers. He had too many people that loved him and followed him. But there was a plan afoot. There was something going on that people didn't understand. <clears throat> and some people nowadays that read the Bible still don't understand. And in Matthew 26, verses 48 and 49, it says, Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whosoever I shall kiss... That same is he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Jesus was betrayed by his very friend, his, one of his apostles, his disciples, that he had chosen. His friend betrayed him because of this plan that was afoot, this story that was going to unfold. And he was betrayed 
with a kiss. And they grabbed him and they took him. <clears throat> and they put him, I guess they don't use handcuffs back then, but they put him in some kind of restraints. And they took him before the authorities in the middle of the night. Why? Because Jesus had too many friends, too many people that loved him and followed him. So they did this at night. They held the court at night. So no one would be there except for the people that they wanted there to make it happen the way they wanted it to happen. It was a kangaroo court. And Jesus told them in Matthew 26, verse 53, how powerful he was. He said, thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. That's a lot of angels. And he could have done that. He said so. It is amazing. But he didn't do it. In Isaiah 53, 3, it says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Um, and we esteemed him not. This is the way he was depicted in prophecy, in prophecy to be treated, and he was. He's been treated like this all through the ages, all through time. People nowadays still deny him. They say he never existed. At best, you get... Yeah, he was just a prophet. He was just a guy walking around spreading some stuff. But he wasn't the son of God. I feel sorry for him. <clears throat> and the crux of this is the way that this was written in Isaiah. And it says, and we hid as it were our faces. It's like we are saying this. It's like we do this. We esteemed him not. And it goes on. In Isaiah 52, 14, and it says, As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Jesus was beaten, tortured, he was spit on, and eventually put on the cross. You have to remember that the beating he took was physical, punches, sticks, probably, the ends of spears, not the sharp end, but the dull end, probably kicked. The whip was probably the cat of nine tails, filled with hooks and barbs, glass, pieces of pottery, that when it hit you, it stuck to you, and then you don't pull out, you pull off, ripping the flesh from you. I mean, it says he was marred more than any man. You don't get that way just from a straight single rope or single whip lashing. I mean, on the movies, that's the way they show it because they can only get so gory, and, and that's fine. I don't need it anymore. But this is what he went through. And remember, this is the guy who could have over 12 legions of angels come to his rescue. But he's doing this. Isaiah 53, verse 7 says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. It's like he walked right in for all this. Basically, he, he was unopposed, the, unopposed to them. He set himself up to do this. I think this is the only place in Scripture where Jesus is compared to dumb. But that's what he 
did, and that's what he wanted. In Matthew 27, verse 35, it says, And they crucified him, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled. which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did cast lots. What a way to go. What a way to go. Especially when you can stop it. You know, there's Christians killed in this world all the time for their beliefs, but they have no power to stop it. Jesus had the power to stop it. But he didn't. Now go back to where I started with in John 1. The word created everything. Jesus was the word. Jesus created the planet. Jesus created the atmosphere. The sun, the moon, the water. Remember, he told the water, you can go no farther than this point. He created the animals. And then he created his greatest creation. And I say that tongue-in-cheek. Humans. They couldn't go, but I don't know how so long, it doesn't say, before they fouled that up, that relationship up, and got kicked out of the garden. Because people can't follow God. They're stupid. And we're no better. He's done all these things. He's done all these miracles, all these wonders, created all this. The maker of man. Rich Mullins referred to him as the maker of noses. I didn't know this was going to be this hard. All right. The creator of mankind, he's taken, he's beaten, whipped, spit on, ridiculed, eventually nailed to a cross where suffocation is what's supposed to kill you. I think it was just a combination of it all. And all this happened to him by the very creation that he created. The creator let his creation do this to him. The very creation took the creator and beat him and nailed him to a cross. To watch him die. And remember, at any moment, he could have stopped it. He could have finished it. It would have been over for them. But Jesus endured his murder. He endured his kangaroo court his false accusations. Remember, he never committed a crime. You know, we don't really worry about the crime part, but, you know, usually people got murdered or killed on the cross for crimes against the state or the public. He never even sinned. And sin is not a crime necessarily. I mean, murder is, yeah. But lying is not a crime unless you do it in court. That's the difference. When we lie, we know that we're not offending the person we're lying to, really. We're offending God. When we steal, we're not offending the person we steal from. We're offending God. God is watching us. That's how it's so easy to keep 
something simple like the commandments. But back to the story. At any moment, he could have stopped this, but he endured the murder. All for one reason. He allowed his creation to kill him, the creator, because he knew in them doing that, the creation received a blessing. The creation received salvation, a blessing. And so he was willing to withstand that and to go through that so that we, his creation, and those back then even, and all in between, could receive a blessing. Isaiah 29, verse 16 says, Surely your turning up of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say to him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? This is what happened. This is exactly what occurred. The potter made us. We're all clay. And then we turned around and said, you didn't make me. You're not my God. You don't know. You don't understand anything about us. We know. And we killed him. And he could have stopped it. But he said, no, if I do this, they'll receive a blessing. That's what love is, folks. That's true love. Romans 5 and verse 8 says, But God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Thessalonians 5.10 repeats it basically. Who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. There is no way we will be able to live together with Christ without him going through this and agreeing to it. Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I don't know about y'all, but I can go through things I've done, done wrong, and it all got put on him. It's not right. It's not right. But that's the way he willed it, and that's the way he wanted it. And he's my God and my creator, so I accept it. But it wasn't right. John 1, verses 12 and 13 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is the gift that we get. By killing Jesus Christ, we get to be sons of God. How ironic, because we don't deserve it. But I don't want to labor on that, I don't want you to labor on that thought, because... It's the way God set it up. It's the way he planned it. It's the way it is. Don't hold it against yourself. First Peter chapter 2, 24 says, Who of his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. That's what he did for us. He's healed us, and that's why we change. That's why we lead another life. That's why we stop doing things that most people do, and we change. It's not that much. It's not that hard, but we change. We didn't deserve any of this story. Ashamed is what we deserve. We should be. But I'll tell you, I needed, 
I needed this story to happen. I needed this man murdered. I needed to see Christ die because I need him in me. I need him in me. What about you? The only way you get the blessings is for the story to have happened and then for you to believe. So enjoy the story. It was played out all for you.